So no joke, there is an actual CIA document that was recently declassified, which I'm about to show you, that discusses the topics of lost ancient human civilizations and cataclysmic events that happened on Earth thousands of years ago that caused those ancient civilizations to vanish off the Earth and without a trace. Thus answering the question why there is so much mystery and unanswered questions involving our true ancient past. And it's hard to even know where to begin with this, as this document is 57 pages long and there's just so much to say about it. So give me a few minutes to connect the dots on a variety of fascinating details that are included in this declassified document, and I will show you later in the video exactly how to find it so you can read it for yourself. But the creator of this document even describes the Great Pyramid of Giza, Egypt as an enigma, which yes, it certainly is. As even to this day in 2019, we are unable to explain how the Great Pyramid was even constructed. We can't even wrap our minds around its confusing internal design and layout, which indicates some sort of purpose that is beyond our current understanding, as it shares absolutely no resemblance to that of any other Egyptian tomb ever found. Like I've mentioned before, no mummy was ever found inside any of the pyramids, and there are a total of zero hieroglyphs inside of any of the pyramids either. Another interesting fact that I've mentioned before is that not one single hieroglyph found anywhere throughout ancient Egypt shows anything related to a pyramid whatsoever. What a bizarre fact, right? The Great Pyramid was even the tallest man-made structure in the world for nearly 4,000 years. That was until the construction of the Lincoln Cathedral in England in the 1100s, but keep in mind that its record height included the central spire which no longer even exists today as it collapsed just a couple hundred years after its construction. I must say that I find the Great Pyramid to be far more impressive. I mean, let's not forget that it's built like a three-dimensional puzzle, made up of some two and a half million stone blocks that are stacked with unbelievable precision nearly 500 feet high and 750 feet wide at its base. But the declassified file also lists other mysterious sites as being enigmas, including that of Easter Island, which of course is located in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean, leaving us many questions as to how people found and settled on this remote island so long ago. Easter Island is most known for the mysterious Moai statues, which are the subject of much debate as to who they were meant to depict and why. And also, how were they created, moved, and positioned in the way that they were in the first place? But what is perhaps more interesting than that is just how massive they actually are. Something that most people are not aware of, and they can really only be appreciated when compared to people standing next to them. This declassified document details that Easter Island was actually part of a lost continent called Mu, or Mu, that was said to have sank in the Pacific Ocean during a cataclysm, and Easter Island is all that's left of it. And I'll certainly be discussing more about that later in this video, but I have to mention another ancient site that is included in this document that is listed as an enigma, and that is Baalbek in Lebanon. If there was one site that is truly an enigma besides that of the Great Pyramid, it's Baalbek and the foundation stones of the Heliopolis that also make up the foundations of the Temple of Jupiter and the Temple of Bacchus. If there ever was an example of a lost ancient civilization that possessed some type of relatively advanced technology, keywords there, relatively advanced, the 900-ton Trilophon stone blocks are perhaps one of the best examples of it. And just look how massive they are when compared to people standing next to them. And although modern archaeologists and historians credit ancient Rome for these massive monoliths, there is actually no evidence to support it as the Romans did not have the technological capability to have moved or lifted these stones or stones of this weight. In fact, literally nothing from ancient Rome even compares to the magnitude of these stone blocks as the largest stone block within Rome is the capital block, which is only 53 tons. And that is not to say that 53 tons isn't heavy, but not when compared to the Trilophon stones, which again are 900 tons a piece, which equates to closer to 2 million pounds and were somehow lifted over 30 feet up and stacked with precise alignment and precision. And this doesn't include the several blocks located on top of the Heliopolis, which are estimated to be at 800 tons apiece. Even the smallest blocks that make up the foundation are over 400 tons each, and there are many of them. A significant detail that is often overlooked is the awkward fact that the Romans did not even credit themselves 
for building the foundation of this site or the foundations of the Temple of Jupiter or the Temple of Bacchus, which is truly bizarre when we consider the fact that the Romans documented everything. They claim to have built upon the site as evidence supports, but they do not take credit for the foundation stones whatsoever. What makes it even more unusual is the distance that Baalbek is from the Roman capital, which is actually closer to 1,400 miles away, but it would actually be significantly further when traveling only by land and not by sea. So isn't it weird that the world's largest and most impressive ancient monoliths ever found, which are allegedly from the Romans, are in such a remote location that is so far from the capital, and again, they didn't even take credit for creating them in the first place. So although the Roman Colosseum, as well as the Roman aqueducts, are unbelievably impressive and marbles of engineering and mathematics, the largest blocks that they are made up of are small multi-ton blocks, which are but a small fraction of the 900-ton, 800-ton, and many 400-ton stone blocks that make up the foundation of the Heliopolis, and are simply not comparable. Again, these structures are impressive, but they do not demonstrate an ability to move and stack 2 million pound stone blocks 30 feet high with precise alignment. So if the Romans didn't credit themselves for building it, why do modern historians say that they did? Well, it actually comes down to one simple reason, which is that they say that there were no other civilizations besides the Romans in that region. So therefore, if it wasn't the Romans, it couldn't possibly be anyone else because there was no one there before them. So therefore, it was the Romans. <laughs> Right. But then again, these are the same people that say that civilization only began 6,000 years ago with the Sumerians, and these are the same people that completely ignore the topics of the Sphinx's water erosion, as well as the site of Gobekli Tepe, which all prove dates further back than 12,000 years. And of course, I've discussed those details in many other videos, so I digress. Now, other ancient sites listed in the declassified document as enigmas include Tiwanaku in South America, which I'll be coming back to later in the video, along with Easter Island, as they both tie into other fascinating things that are discussed in the released document. But when I say document, it really is essentially an essay that was put together as a non-fiction book written by some unknown person by the name of Chan Thomas back in 1963, and was published by Emerson House in 1965 under the title, The Adam and Eve Story. But for some completely unknown and mysterious reason or reasons, this book was classified by the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, back in 1966. And it wasn't made public again until 2013, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act. But it wasn't actually released to the public until 2016, and was done so in the form of a heavily sanitized document. In fact, at the very top and bottom of every single page, it literally states those exact words. But listen to this, and this is where things get weird and will really make you think. So when I say it was heavily sanitized, the original book was apparently 284 pages long, and yet the only released 57 pages. In fact, they omitted entire pages altogether. For example, the release file jumps from page 7 to page 9, leaving us with no answers as to why all of page 8 was completely removed from the release document. And there's also no blacked out redactions of any kind found anywhere in the 57 pages, but the fact that it was sanitized means that it was pieced back together in ways that we are not aware of. So think about it like this. They released 57 pages out of apparently 284, so that equates to about 20%. <laughs> so the big question is, what about the other 80%? The significant majority of this file is still classified, and there's no explanation of why. Does, tell me that doesn't make your eyebrow go up. Like, what's that about? <laughs> so yeah, I find that really strange and bizarre, especially when you consider the unbelievably bizarre nature of what's included in the files that they did release to the public. But let me just say up front, I do not believe that every detail that's discussed in these papers are true or accurate. Surely some of this stuff is just so crazy and so unbelievable that it just cannot be true. I mean, some of it sounds like straight up pseudoscience, if I'm being honest, such as describing 1,000 mile an hour winds and entire continents being submerged in miles of ocean waves during a cataclysmic pole shift event. Even going on to suggest that the Earth's crust, and will again in the future, be drastically displaced during a pole shift event, which according to the document is caused by some type of reoccurring explosion or disruption within the Earth's core, causing land that was under the ocean to rise, and in certain cases, certain mountain chains that are on land 
to submerge under the ocean following this event, which of course scientists today will absolutely declare as fiction and pseudoscience. I mean, the document even states that there was a race of blonde hair, blue eyed people that once existed on earth that were more advanced in science than we are today, at least as of 1963, when the essay was actually written. Now, obviously some of those details sound crazy. So even if various details described in this document are exaggerated and false, we should not just completely dismiss this document altogether because undoubtedly there are certain things discussed in here that are absolutely true as I'm about to share with you. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, they classify all kinds of different things. So this doesn't necessarily mean anything, but come on. Think of all the crazy conspiracy theories out there that they've never classified that date back decades. And again, to emphasize the point one more time, why didn't they release everything in 2016? Why did they keep 80% of it? I mean, there was a book written by Charles Hapgood in 1958 that discussed very similar information involving earth crust displacement. And that was never classified. But then again, the details that Chan Thomas describes in this declassified document differs in a few key ways. And that may explain why one was classified and the other was not. Now, the document is broken up into six parts, and the first part is the author's description of what will happen during the next civilization resetting cat cataclysm and what it will look like, which of course mentions those 1,000 mile an hour winds and continental flooding, as I just mentioned a moment ago, essentially illustrating the total destruction to this era of mankind, stating that we will share the same fate that our ancient ancestors experienced multiple times in the past, essentially resetting us back to the Stone Age, having to start all over again from scratch with our technological knowledge and developments. The document specifically ties ancient civilizations and religions together in multiple instances throughout the essay. For example, the author declares that Noah, Adam and Eve, the Hindu god Vishnu, and the Egyptian god Osiris are all connected by different individual cataclysms that reset their civilizations over the last tens of thousands of years. Even going on to connect Jesus with Osiris, the Polynesian god Teroa with Zeus and Vishnu, claiming that it all connects with the destruction of Atlantis and the lost continent of Mu and the destruction of the Greek gods on Olympus. Alleging that the roots of ancient stories discussed in the Bible and religions of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam all have the same origin just explained differently as they were passed down over several millennia from culture to culture, religion to religion. And I have to say that I find it highly interesting that it makes the connection between the Greek gods, Hindu gods, and biblical legends originating from the Sumerian god kings from Mesopotamia. Let me give you an example on that that I've given in a prior video involving the depiction of the trident, which is shared among the Sumerians, Hindu god Shiva, and the Greek god Poseidon. Is this really just a coincidence? Because it seems to me that there is a connection here that goes further back than many would think. Even look at the depictions of the cobra snake, a similarity shared among not only Hindu gods, but Egyptians as well. Is it really just a coincidence that they would specifically position the cobra at their heads? Although I do not know what the true meaning of this symbolism was, it is certainly an interesting thing to observe. Even consider the depictions of battling massive snakes, something shared between both Hindu and Greek gods as well. And speaking of the Greek god Poseidon, who was said to be the creator of the lost city of Atlantis, this document specifically discusses the legend of Atlantis, which of course was shared by Plato in the Timaeus, but ultimately originated from the ancient Egyptians from the temple of Sais, Egypt, where Solon had visited and accumulated the information. The document specifically references that cataclysm as being the event behind the legend of Adam and Eve, as well as the destruction of Atlantis. The author also goes to the extent to make the same point that Graham Hancock has made when discussing the topic of Atlantis, on how Solon's story of Atlantis he received from the Egyptians originated from the date of 9,000 years before that time, which was then 600 BC, thus equating to the date of 11,600 years ago, for when Atlantis was destroyed, or approximately 11,550 years ago from, the, from when the author wrote this essay. But just consider that this book was first written in 1963 and published in 1965. Well, what a fantastic point that this unknown person by the name of Chan Thomas happened to write about way far ahead of others. I mean, 
Graham Hancock was something like 13 years old at the time that the author wrote about this. It truly is fascinating that this mysterious author was connecting these dots so many decades before modern alternative researchers were. In fact, this essay connected the dots on multiple details involving the Younger Dryas climate catastrophe, and again, did so decades before so many others. Which, of course, I have discussed the details of the Younger Dryas in many other videos, including details of the date of the events that transpired on Earth some 12,900 years ago and 11,600 years ago. And this document is right there on that date when stating 11,500 years ago. And again, this document was written actually about 56 years ago. It even specifies the rapid melting of the Laurentide ice cap that occurred suddenly at that time as well, which of course is included in the Younger Dryas climate catastrophe, causing a massive surge in global sea levels that happened suddenly. It has been suggested that the deep freeze that the Earth went through that followed the rapid melting of the ice caps during the Younger Dryas event, that the melting of that ice that flowed into the ocean would have likely disrupted the Gulf Stream, which of course plays a significant role in warming our planet, and perhaps that could explain that deep freeze that followed the melting of that ice. So could that be why they have found flash frozen woolly mammoths from that period of time? The document specifically points out the fascinating mystery of woolly mammoths that have been found that were somehow flash frozen even while in the middle of eating. Food found still in their mouths as well as undigested food in their stomachs. And what an interesting detail that this author pieced that together so many decades ago. But let me ask the question, what on earth would it take to flash freeze a massive animal that was meant to thrive during an ice age? This is an unexplained mystery, and when you spend time reflecting on it, it's pretty astonishing. So the next part is highly controversial, and many will deny its possibility, but the document describes that this event, which was a geomagnetic pole shift that caused catastrophic changes in weather as well as massive changes in the Earth's crust, all happening within a 6 to 12 hour period, essentially a quarter to half of a day and was the result of an explosion or rupture inside of the Earth's core which wreaked havoc on Earth over the next six days. It goes on to explain that the core of the Earth physically shifts which causes the magnetic poles to change, but it also causes the Earth's crust to move over that liquid inner Earth. And the catastrophe happens when the atmosphere and oceans continue with their momentum on their normal path, thus inundating continents with water and causing unprecedented winds in the atmosphere. Let me make this clear. Mainstream science denies the possibility of Earth crust displacement and considers this to be straight up pseudoscience. So I am not suggesting that it is true, but I certainly find the topic interesting and, work, and worth looking at, especially since Albert Einstein considered the theory to have merit. And in fact, he actually provided the foreword on Charles Hapgood's book on this topic. But let's consider what we do know, or should I say what mainstream scientific and academic sources agree upon on the topic of pole shifts, which is that the constant movement of the molten iron at the, core, at the Earth's core creates the magnetic field that protects us from the vacuum of space, solar radiation, and essentially contains our atmosphere. And according to these same sources, geomagnetic pole shifts absolutely do happen. We have evidence of more than 100 examples dating back millions of years. And they say that the last one was some 780,000 years ago. But they also state that they normally occur every 200 to 300,000 years. So we are essentially some 500,000 years overdue for some mysterious and unknown reason. They say that when the next shift happens, it will likely not move the crust or cause earthquakes or volcanic activity, but rather it will weaken the Earth's magnetic shields by possibly, get this, 80 to 90 percent, thus increasing solar radiation significantly for a period of time and causing what will be massive failures in satellites, various communication systems, and cause mass widespread power, power outages that could last for months on end. So let's be real. That in itself will be absolutely catastrophic as we are now so dependent on electricity and our supply chain. Gas pumps won't work, grocery stores will empty in just a couple of days, and even the internet and phones won't work. There will certainly be civil unrest and chaos if the lights are out for more than just a couple days at a time. You know, I have to say, as someone that has curiously followed the topic of pole shifts, that I've noticed a pattern among news networks that cover the topic, as they always seem to downplay 
the significance and how catastrophic a geomagnetic pole shift will actually be. For example, they never seem to mention on how when the magnetic field gets reduced, it's going to affect weather patterns as well as ocean currents, which, I mean, that in itself is gonna be catastrophic. And I'm not saying that there is some cover-up, but anyone familiar with the topic of cataclysms on Earth knows that for some reason, mainstream science and academia largely shun these topics. Maybe they just don't wanna freak out the masses to things that are beyond our control, so they just kinda <laughs> quietly leave those things out. I don't know. And just as a quick side note, I wonder if there is some connection between the pole shifts and the pending discovery of Planet Nine, which astronomers are absolutely convinced that it exists and has a massive orbit of thousands or tens of thousands of years and located far out from Pluto. It has a mysteriously large mass, and I wonder if pole shifts could be caused by cosmic influences involving magnetism or gravity. Could Planet Nine and pole shifts be connected? Because there is already speculation that Planet Nine could explain the mysterious tilt in various planets within our solar system. But this is just an idea, who knows? But consider these other details that will certainly make you think. We know that we are overdue for a geomagnetic pole shift, and we know that the next one is already underway. You may have seen headlines over the past few months stating that scientists were shocked to learn that the North Pole has moved much faster and much further than they had projected, thus creating an emergency to update GPS systems throughout the world, and as well as updating runway numbers for airplanes. This is as recently as the last several weeks, but it really isn't that new, as these, this also made headlines going all the way back to 2011 and 2012, so the pole movement has been going on for some time. In fact, they've now identified that the North Pole has moved at a rate of 34 miles per year, and evidence going back to 1990 shows it has moved more than 600 miles since then. But what makes it so alarming is the fact that the pole shifts start slow and eventually accelerate rapidly until it finally flips. So now we are seeing scientists get surprised at its current acceleration. Well, this should warrant a closer eye by scientists, which, well, actually in reality, they certainly are paying a lot of attention to this because you may have noticed various science articles circulating over just the past few months stating that ocean currents are now slowing down as we speak. Keep in mind that this connects to shifting poles as Ocean currents are influenced by the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is influenced by our geomagnetic poles. And we know that ocean currents affect global climate and weather. I mean, it heats the Earth. It's just one further detail that indicates that our next pole shift is in motion as we speak. So the question is, when will it inevitably happen? And I can't help but wonder if that mysterious seismic wave that was detected just a few months ago back in November, and you may have not have heard of this, has anything to do with the movement within the inner Earth and pole shifts. Because scientists detected waves that traveled around the world at some 9,000 miles an hour and have absolutely no idea what caused it. It was not noticeable for people around the world the day that it happened, but seismic data shows that it occurred, leaving many unanswered questions. So with those unanswered questions aside, we must ask a big question here, which is, why are we so overdue for a pole shift? And by overdue, a half a million years overdue, what's that about? Well, the document claims, and this is what makes this document so unique in this theory, that the poles do a 90 degree flip when it reverses, and then within a six day window, it flips right back to its original location, thus masking that the event had ever happened for modern geologi uh, geologic uh, measurements. So essentially, it's saying that this thing happens every 6,500 years, which I don't know if that's true, <laughs> But that is why we have no record of it and think that we're long overdue when really we're not. It's saying that 780,000 years ago was just the last time that we have evidence of it, but it keeps happening. And this is a key difference between the Earth crust displacement theory written about by Charles Hapgood. Could this be the reason why Chan Thomas's essay was classified and Hapgood's book was not? I mean, think about it. This document states that this is happening every 6,500 years, and when it happens, the poles flip right back to the original location. Charles Hapgood did not state that. And although this certainly sounds unbelievable, I really, and I would also think, by the way, that we would have more evidence to support if this was actually true. I mean, every 6,500 years. But then again, we have to remind ourselves that the earliest documentation of any civilization we know about is the Sumerians of 6,000 years ago. 
Yet humans date back something like 300,000 plus years, and we only know about 6,000 years ago, and we know so little about that. So it seems to me that cataclysms could explain why we have such a mysterious past. So again, I'm not sure that there's enough evidence to support that the poles flip every 6,500 years, but I do find the sudden and rapid changing of the Sahara, how it went from lush green to a desert wasteland practically overnight. And time frames for this, and when it was thought to have happened, is right around that 6,500 year ago mark, give or take. Well, combine that with the fact that there is no current scientific explanation for how or why this happened to the Sahara Desert in the first place. So, could it be pole shift related? So although there is disagreement as far as how often pole shifts happen, why they happen, or how devastating the effects will be after they happen, the one thing that everyone seems to agree upon is the fact that, well, they do happen, and that we are now due or overdue for the next one. But think of it like this. They ultimately occur because of the shifting of the massive molten iron core that our crust essentially floats upon, which, by the way, is the reason why there is continental drift in the first place, which we know occurs at a rate of about one inch per year. We also have earthquakes, which, although some originate within the crust, many actually occur in the part of the upper mantle which is liquid. And when that movement occurs, it passes through our crust and results in an earthquake. So why wouldn't the sudden shift in that liquid cause earthquakes and perhaps a brief yet accelerated movement of the continents, i.e. some level of earth crust displacement? I mean, if the 2011 Japanese earthquake and tsunami, which was a magnitude 8.9 earthquake, was able to move the entire coast of Japan by eight feet in a matter of moments, and I've discussed this in other videos, that's something that should have taken about 100 years to occur with normal continental drift, but it happened all in a moment, and scientists were absolutely stunned by that discovery. And not only did it move Japan eight feet, it also shortened the days on Earth by 1.6 microseconds, which might not sound like a lot, but consider this, it even changed the tilt of the Earth's axis by six and a half inches. Literally, this one earthquake moved the Earth. And this isn't the only example of continental crust movement from an earthquake. I mean, take the 7.8 magnitude earthquake that moved two islands off the coast of New Zealand by five meters or over 16 feet, which is double the movement of the Japan earthquake. And at one point, scientists did not think that that, that was even possible, but that was until they saw it with their own eyes and had documentation of it. So if you think that earth crust displacement is 100% impossible pseudoscience, you should consider the awkward fact that virtually all scientists once considered continental drift to be pseudoscience, and that was as recently as just 100 years ago. And think about how these earthquakes would ultimately throw off our geologic timeline estimates in the future for continental drift, such as the example of Pangaea and how long they think it took to break apart. Well, if we weren't aware of the Japanese and New Zealand earthquakes, which, like I said, the Japan earthquake accounted for some 100 years of continental drift in one moment, so it makes you wonder what other earthquakes occurred in the distant past that, of course, we have no knowledge of, that actually moved various regions of land that led to inaccurate land movement estimates uh, for continental drift in modern times. So essentially, scientists are confused by the data they're looking at. You see, it's examples like this that should humble scientists to realize that <laughs> there's just so much that we don't know. We think we know a lot, but in reality, we probably have all kinds of data in front of us that's throwing us off from other events that we don't even know occurred. So with all that said, could there be some truth to earth crust displacements? I mean, even if a majority of what's discussed in this essay is just exaggerated or false, could there be some truth to it under certain rare circumstances, such as with earthquakes or when pole shifts happen and our crust floating on top of that magma down below our feet, could that play any part in movement of the crust in ways that we didn't think were possible? Because keep in mind, we've never even witnessed a pole shift. We don't have the data to prove what actually happens when it does occur, right? Something that is very interesting to consider is that this theory mirrors the legend of Atlantis and its destruction, which was said to have sunk into the depths of the ocean. It certainly makes me wonder about the nature of the recot structure, which I've proposed had collapsed and had risen again, part of its geologic dome or volcanic dome. So it's striking similarities to Lost City of Atlantis aside, which yes, I will definitely be making a follow-up video on the topic of the recot structure and, and Atlantis in the not so distant future, but this essay gives a specific example involving the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea, stating that they were both not under the ocean prior to the last pole shift. 
And this raises questions about the Bimini Road, which is in the Caribbean and is 18 feet or about five and a half meters underwater today. There is so much to debate about this, but was it man-made? Was it a man-made road or is it just some type of natural formation? Now let's consider what the document states about Mew and Easter Island. It claims that it sank into the Pacific Ocean and Easter Island is what's left of it. Well, if that were the case, perhaps it could explain the irregularities in DNA evidence that connects the Aborigines of Australia to South America. As I mentioned this in a video two years ago, but there was a huge wrench thrown into the known human migration process when they discovered that mummies found in South America have the DNA of Aborigines from Australia. This is a confusing mystery even today among scientists as they don't know how this happened. But that of course does not necessarily give credence to that there was a continent in the Pacific Ocean that allowed them to walk across it to South America from Australia. But keep in mind that the author declares that the Peruvian Andes were under the ocean prior to the pole shift as well. And this of course sounds unbelievable considering that it is now 22,000 feet above sea level. But isn't it interesting to mention that scientists agree that the Andes were once under the ocean in the distant past. There are even fish and whale bones in fossils, I should say, found at the top of both the Andes and even the Himalayan mountains. All of which, like I said, are now fossils with estimations to be many millions of years old, but why would there be fish and whale bones at the top of these mountains if it had not ridden, or risen so rapidly? Think about it. If the mountains formed so slowly over so many millions of years, wouldn't the fish and whales have had time to not beach themselves? That's just something to think about, but the author includes a Bible verse, uh, Psalms 46, as a supportive example of the rising and falling of continents as witnessed by survivors of that cataclysm. And it reads, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And actually, the author includes a few other interesting things uh, in the documentation from ancient times, suggesting as evidence that these cataclysms were witnessed by people. For example, the author also makes note of a legend out of Tierra del Fuego in South America of when the sun was said to set in the east and had risen in the west. Also annotated are legends out of Peru of the day that the sun stood still, as well as legends from the Malaysian and Sumatran Aborigines of the so-called Long Night and even makes note of the interesting similarities among languages from around the world, including Polynesian to Greek, Egyptian, Mayan, and even the Eskimos. These details raise questions, and although myths and legends do exist, we know that they originate from something, and it makes you wonder. The author even includes a direct excerpt from Plato's Timaeus, which of course discusses the legend of Atlantis, but also illustrates how past cataclysms have left us with no knowledge of our true ancient past which he claims our ancestors were the most fair and noble of all races of men that had ever lived on the earth. And for the sake of brevity, go ahead and press pause so you can read that on your own. But it is interesting. Like, what made them come to this conclusion? But you may also be curious as to what the very last page of the declassified document states. Quote, a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing, or it can be a vibrant seed giving rise to verdant forests and awakening sleeping giants. That is literally the very end of the 57 page essay. Does this in any way give a clue as to why this was classified in the first place? Basically insinuating that although we could use this knowledge to help us, that the knowledge could also, well, <laughs> freak the hell out of humanity as a whole. I mean, come on. If people knew that there was some sort of pending cataclysmic event on earth that nobody could stop, and, and would ultimately cause our civilization's demise. I mean, maybe people would stop going to work. Maybe people would riot or stop paying their taxes or whatever, right? Now, I did some digging on this Chan Thomas guy and I quickly found that he had published a book of the same name in 1993 that was 232 pages long. So 52 pages less than the classified version that was apparently 284. But this 1993 version was not classified. So it makes you wonder what was left out of those 52 pages in the non-classified version. But, I mean, what's this about? And what's the difference? I mean, is this just a way that Chan Thomas found to make money while staying within the classified limits of his previous work from nearly 30 years earlier? I really don't know, I and mean, I'm just thinking out loud, but why was this classified 
from the get-go. I mean, how does that even happen? <laughs> Did the CIA show up at this guy's door and say, hey, we want to classify this? And, and would, can they do that? And would Chan Thomas have just gone along with that? Would they have to pay him money for his work? You know what I mean? Like, this is, this is confusing. Like, I, what's this about? <laughs> And again, why can't I find any information on this guy? I mean, the most information you'll find is what's included in the about the author section of this essay, which of course was written by Chan Thomas himself. So this is certainly strange. And of course, so many things in this document are bizarre and unbelievable. But again, if this was all pseudoscience, which maybe some of it is, uh, but why would they classify it then in the first place? And then when they go ahead and release it, which was forced by the Freedom of Information Act, <laughs> They keep 80% of it? Yeah, so that, that's, that's really weird, guys. And so it makes me think that, you know what, there is something here. There's something to see here. And I think that it involves the nature of pole shifts. I think they know that the next one's coming. It's gonna be cataclysmic, and maybe that's the real reason why this was classified as it had better evidence than, say, other theories of the same idea. I don't know. Now, I'm sure that you wanna see this with your own eyes. So let me quickly show you exactly how to find this document so you can discover that not only does it actually exist, but you can read it yourself. And the absolute fastest way to find it is to simply Google the words CIA Adam and Eve story, which will bring the PDF version right up at the top, which you can click on and view instantly. Or you can go to www.cia.gov, click on library, and then click on uh, Freedom of Information Act, and then search the words Adam and Eve, which will then bring it up to the top so you can click on that. Again, why on earth is this weird ass document on the CIA's website, which was forced to be made, made public by the Freedom of Information Act? I mean, this is a big question here. Now, I also recommend that you check out another video by a YouTuber who discussed this document as well. And that YouTuber is called Suspicious Observers. I'm not familiar with this channel uh, as I haven't seen their other videos, but in this video, he raised some outstanding questions about this document and connected the dots on some fascinating details that I did not include in this video as there's just too much to discuss. So go check that out. But before I wrap this up, what about the 12,000 year old comet hypothesis that I've discussed in so many other videos, which there is an abundance of evidence to support? Many have concluded that this is what caused the Younger Dryas climate catastrophe and I certainly buy into that. So my idea in all of this is that Perhaps, maybe, both events happened. What if there was a cosmic impact around 12,900 years ago as has been suggested, and then perhaps there was a pole shift 11,600 years ago? Or maybe the cosmic impact caused the pole shift to happen. Maybe Graham Hancock and Dr. Robert Schock are both right, that perhaps there was an impact, but maybe there also, there also was plasma bursts from the sun which were able to torch the earth, as has been suggested by Dr. Robert Schock, and during the last pole shift when the Earth's magnetic field or shields would have been significantly reduced to the harm of the sun. So maybe both happened, I don't know. What I can say is that, <laughs> talk about total devastation if both these events happened consecutively, or even 12, 1300 years apart, because something happened 12,900 years ago, and then something else happened 11,600 years ago. What, so the question is what? Anyways, I'm gonna wrap this up. This is getting very long. I've only covered a fraction of what's in this document. It's unbelievably interesting. So I recommend you check it out with an open mind. I mean, again, it was classified for a reason and they didn't give all of it back to us when they did declassify it. So there is something to see here, clearly. But anyways, again, I'll wrap this up here. Uh, many people are wondering, where have I been for the last few months? Uh, go to my community tab under my YouTube homepage. In fact, I'll put a link in like my pinned comment at the top. But uh, I explain where I've been and what I've been doing. But uh, subscribe to me on Instagram. I created an Instagram account. I want to stay in touch with everybody more often. Um, and I also have a Twitter, but Twitter's pretty lame. <laughs> but uh, anyways, get with me on uh, Instagram and Twitter. But I'll be making many more videos in a short period of time here. I'm, I'm no longer going to put dates and time frames on when I say I'm going to make a video because there's nothing worse than failing to, uh, you know, fulfill a promise. But I have a couple other videos in the works right now that I think you're gonna find very interesting. So anyways, I'll leave it at that. I'm Jimmy, this is Bright Insight. Leave a comment, let me know what your thoughts are on all of this. And also hit the like button and subscribe, but I'll wrap it up there. Take care, everybody.